This morning we are continuing in our study in the book of Genesis, which we have subtitled The Reality of Everything. It's really the book of origins, and it's the most astonishing and amazing book of history in the world. You know, and as we are in the discussion of Noah and the ark, even people who say they don't know much about the Bible, they seem to always know about Noah and the ark. They know about the animals coming in two by two. They know about the great flood covering the earth. They know about the rainbow and the promise of God to never flood the earth again. In fact, I discovered a list which I did tip off to many of you with an email called Everything I Needed to Know I Learned from Noah's Ark. Number one, don't miss the boat. Number two is remember we're all in the same boat. Number three, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Number four, stay fit. When you're 600 years old, somebody might ask you to do something big. Number five, don't listen to the critics. Just get on with the job that needs to be done. Number six, speed is not everything. The snails were on board along with the cheetahs. Number seven, remember that the ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic by professionals. And number eight, no matter what the storm, remember that when you're walking with God, there is a rainbow waiting just for you. So for those who are new to the story and those who are familiar with the story, here is our text for today with Brian Harden.
Most cultures around the world have flood stories. Did you know that? Most of the flood stories contain the following elements. Number one, that man had sinned. That the destruction was divinely caused. That there was a favored family. That a boat was provided. That the animals were saved. That the destruction was universal. That the survivors landed on a mountain. And that birds were sent out. And that the survivors worshipped with divine favor upon them. These flood stories are found in the most ancient civilizations around the world. And I've got a list there on the screen. In the Middle East, Greece, Egypt, Italy, Lithuania, Russia, China, India, Native Indians, Mexico, Peru, Fiji, Hawaii, and many others as well. How is it possible that a flood story exists in all of these ancient civilizations if it wasn't for the fact that the flood was a historical event? And if it wasn't for the fact that people have a common origin? And if it wasn't for the fact that our forefathers around the world shared the flood experience? Even so, people take many different views and approaches to this epic story. Some continue to insist that it is an ancient myth. It's some old fable that just went viral. Some like to only focus on the controversial aspects of the story, like how in the world did Noah get all those animals on the ark anyways? Could all the animals actually fit on the ark, along with all the food and water that they would need? And how did, how did Noah do all those chores? <laughs> wow! Every day. And then there are some who focus on the scientific questions associated and raised by the story. And believe me, there are many scientific questions. I reviewed a 40-page article online by, from the National Center for Science Education. And this 40-page article ends with Five pages of 150 scholarly entries. This on the bibliography. Like, this is a major, major article. And it had 40 pages of questions about the construction of the ark, about the accommodation of the animals, about the gathering of the cargo, about the, um, the care of the animals, and about, and I hadn't thought about this one, the disembarking of the animals. All questions about how would this happen. The title of the article, as you can see, is The Impossible Voyage of Noah's Ark. So right up front, you don't have to guess about its conclusion, right? The Impossible Voyage of Noah's Ark. Well, that's okay. What else is new? Doubters will doubt, haters will hate, skeptics will be skeptical, and unbelievers will refuse to believe, almost no matter what the evidence says, unless God changes their view and their heart. At the end of the day, you know what you and I are? We're believers. At the end of the day, that's what we are. We're believers. We, it doesn't mean we check our brains at the door. It means that we believe the data and we believe the reality. It's just that we interpret the data and the reality differently than others do. Forty pages of questions, and I'm certain that every single question that's posed in this long article does, in fact, have an answer. In fact, many of the answers to these questions I knew already because I read the account in the Bible. It's right there in the pages of the Scriptures themselves, and the National Center for Science Education, I think they read it, but it's, you can't really tell if they read it from what they say. But we freely admit, I freely admit, standing here in front of you, that some of the questions about Noah's voyage, which, by the way, was not a voyage at all. More about that in a second. Some of the questions we will never know the answer to, not until we walk up to the bearded old man in glory and shake his hands and ask him face to face. And I look forward to doing that. 
There is a substantial element of faith to the story of Noah's Ark. And that's because at the end of the day, it's in the Bible, which is a book of faith. It's not a science textbook. It's a book of faith. And you can't please God without? You can't. Faith. The Bible was designed and written by the Holy Spirit to require faith. So ultimately, it is up to you and the grace of God that is at work in you to believe and to understand as much as you can and to learn as much as you can and apply the many, many spiritual lessons contained within it. My prayer is always that the Holy Spirit would help us all to believe every single word in God's Word. The story of Noah and the ark, the whole Old Testament front to back, the whole New Testament, and together its singular story, because there is only one story in the Bible, and that is the story of the coming of Jesus Christ to this earth. And so this morning, uh, the message is called the Ark of Salvation, and this message has two distinct halves. The first half is about the physical ark, and some of you are going to be real excited about that message, and some of you are going to be like, come on, do we have to talk about this? And the second half of the message is on the spiritual ark. The text in Genesis 6 that was read for us this morning provides very specific information about the design of the ark, about the reason for its construction, about the promise that was given concerning the ark, about the passengers that are listed, and about the cargo that was on board. It's all listed there in Genesis 6, and it's to be read as facts. It's to be read as data and as history. You'll remember how this section begins. This is the account of Noah. That phrase, this is the account of, I'll say it for at least the sixth time, this reoccurs throughout the book of Genesis. Because the book of Genesis is really a collection of materials, this person's account, that person's account, that person's account, and Moses brought it all together and wrote the book of Genesis. Who wrote down the account of Noah? Noah did. Noah wrote it down And 800 years later, Moses included the information in the book of Genesis. The Hebrew word for ark is, there it is, tabah. And tabah simply means box or container. And you know what's fascinating? Is that the word tabah is only used here in conjunction with the story of Moses, 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 Moses. No, Noah. That's how I got my Noah and my Moses mixed up, but you'll understand my confusion in one second. It's only used here in conjunction with the story of Noah. Of course, the word ark is used many times in this story, but it's always taba. The only other time in the Bible we find this word taba is in Exodus chapter 2, where we find a much smaller ark, taba, floating in in the Nile River with a certain little baby inside whose name is Moses. Moses. Hence the Moa, Moses, Noah. It's interesting. There's two arcs in the Old Testament. Noah's ark and there's the little one from Moses. Noah's ark was not built to be a yacht. It was not built to be a seagoing vessel. It was not built to go anywhere. It was just this enormous, well-ventilated, floating container. There's no instructions for a rudder, because that wasn't important. Noah didn't have to steer it anywhere. He just needed to float for a while. The ark itself is extremely large. When we convert our cubits, which is not a standard unit of measurement anymore, we see that the ark is 510 feet long. It is 50 feet high and 80 feet wide. 
In fact, a larger boat has never been constructed until 1858 that we know of. Its design ratio is very similar to the ratio of many super tankers that ply the seven seas and ferry oil around the world. Its ratio is a very stable ratio, almost impossible to capsize, they say. With three decks, there was 120,000 square feet of floor space. 120 thousand square feet of floor space, a total capacity of 1.7 million cubic feet. It had the same capacity as 600 railroad cars with CN. Now was that enough room for all the animals and so on? That all depends. Some have correctly pointed out that it would be absolutely impossible for every species to be carried in the ark. There's just no doubt that that is a fact. There's not enough room in the ark for every species. But what's interesting is that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't use the word for species. The Bible uses a much broader classification, which is called kinds. Kinds. And actually, I'm repeating what was taught to us in November by Creation Ministries International. At the risk of turning this message into one of Mr. Harrison's science lessons, the Bible classification of kinds corresponds to what biologists would call the family level or perhaps the genus level of modern day taxonomy. According to Creation Ministries International, if we go with the genus level of taxonomy, that would mean that there would be no more than 16,000 land animals and birds on the ark. If we go with the family level of taxonomy, that means there would be no more than 2,000 land animals and birds on the ark. But let's go with the high number. Let's go with the number 16,000. And so then if we assume that we're going to need similar floor space requirements as on a typical farm, and we're going to assume that God sent Noah, which is interesting, you saw it right in the text, that God would send the animals to Noah. God would send young animals to Noah, not full-grown ones, but young ones. And if we assume that there's no stacking of cages done at all, that would mean still only 47% of the floor space of the ark would have been used. And the animals' provisions would require another 20% of the floor space. Now these things have been studied for a long, long time by many different people, and when all things have been fairly considered, the conclusion every time is that the ark was easily large enough to bring Noah and his family and the land animals safely through the flood. Now the Jeopardy round. Ark reconstruction for 300. Who is John Huber's? John Hubers is a building contractor from Holland, the Netherlands, who built a half-size version of Noah's Ark in 2007. He did it with eight helpers. It took them four years, and out of his own pocket, four million euros. It's anchored in Dordrecht, Netherlands, and it's open to the public. It's still there. But not to be outdone by some Dutchman, the Americans and the Aussies got together to build not a half-size version of the ark, but a full-size version of Noah's ark. And you can find it in Williamstown, Kentucky. This exhibit opened on the seventh day of the seventh month in 2016, at a cost of $150 million. They chose the seventh day of the seventh month to correspond with Genesis 7, verse 7. Clever, eh? And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood, July 7. And this place is called the Ark Encounter. There's a website. 
The Ark Encounter is a Christian theme park, complete with zip lines, restaurants, exotic animals, exhibits, fossil displays, concerts, and of course a gift shop to sell t-shirts to help pay the bills. At night, they light up the ark with rainbow colors, number one, to remind everyone of the covenant that God made with Noah, and number two, to reclaim the rainbow from the gay rights movement. Who somehow managed, who somehow managed to wrestle from the Bible entirely the rainbow? Someone said, "God called. He wants his rainbow back." <laughs> now, the real Noah's Ark has never been found. Some have claimed they have found it, but it's never been found, and almost certainly it never will be found as it came to rest on Mount Ararat, which is a dormant volcano. Mount Ararat has erupted many times, and no wooden structure is going to survive molten lava. But even though that's true, that'll never stop the pranksters, and it'll never stop what I call the full-time adventurers, there was a recent hoax perpetrated in 2010 by an organization that called itself Noah's Ark Ministries. Yeah, I said the word ministries international. This, or, this organization pulled off a hoax where they said that was Noah's Ark. You can still find it on YouTube. You can still find it on the internet all over the place. But it's a hoax that lived for two years until finally somebody who was involved in it came clean and said, that is, we built that thing with old beams that we got over here and we hauled it to Mount Ararat and we built it and blah, blah, blah. It was a complete fabrication. But I mentioned that it'll never stop the, full, the, the pranksters and it'll never stop the full-time adventurers like this guy. This guy's name is Ron Wyatt. And man, he must have all the money in the world to do whatever he wants because he's kind of like Indiana Jones. He just kind of goes around the world and tries to find cool stuff and, and money's never an object for him. He claims this is Noah's Ark and some people believe him, actually. But it might be, because this is in the mountains of Ararat, but the problem is that there's other formations that look just like this in the Ararat Mountains. Now, whether anybody finds Noah's Ark or not, I'm transitioning now from the physical Ark to the spiritual Ark. Whether anybody finds Noah's Ark now, Noah's Ark is a fact. It's a fact. It's not a myth. It's not a fable. It's a fact. And so now, for the duration of this message, it will be my joy to take this fact and translate it into a parable. Because Noah's Ark is one of the most beautiful pictures of Jesus Christ found in the Old Testament. He is the Ark of Salvation to everyone who believes in Him. First of all, the Ark of Salvation is a massive, massive Ark. Immense, cavernous, enormous. And Christ Jesus is an immense, enormous, cavernous, great Savior who saves. The Bible says in Revelation 7 that he will bring a multitude into heaven, a multitude so vast no man can number. We read from Revelation 7, After this I looked, and there was before me a great multitude, and no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. There are some people who say that there will be no one who's saved unless they walk like they do, talk like they do, worship like they do, believe like they do. If you're not a Baptist, some will say, I'm not saying many Baptists will say this, but some will say if you're not my kind of Baptist, 
you can't be saved. If you're not my kind of Pentecostal, you can't be saved. If you're not part of our society, our church, our denomination, you can't be saved. If you're not premillennial in your theology of the end times, you can't be saved. If you're not one who speaks in tongues, you can't be saved. If you've never been baptized as an adult, you can't be saved. I heard, I've heard it all, and so have you. But the Bible preaches a great salvation and a vast multitude of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue who stand before the throne of God that no one can number. That is one mighty ark of salvation. And if you feel the need of a Savior, there is room enough in heaven for you. If the Father who sent His only Son draws you to Him and you come to Him, never think, I wonder if there's going to be room for me. There is room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. It's a mighty, massive ark. Secondly, the ark of salvation is a safe place of refuge. You'll recall that God commanded Noah to coat the entire ark, every single board, every crack, every crevice, coat it with this resinous substance called pitch in order to make it waterproof. And then when the rains came down and the floods came up, the pitch did a perfect job. It was pitch perfect. The ark floated and there was no leak found in her. It rose 27 feet higher than the highest mountain and its precious cargo was kept completely safe. And the Christ that you read of in the Bible and the Christ that you hear preached in this place, He is that kind of safe refuge. There is no weakness in Him. There is no flaw in Him or in His gospel. Just as the ark never sank, Jesus has never failed. Those who are in Christ are safe. They will not perish. In fact, they cannot perish. No one can snatch them out of his hand, Jesus said. Psalm 125, those who trust in the Lord, they are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, which endures forever. That person who believes is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and everything they do prospers. There is no fear of sinking. There's no fear of drowning. There's no fear of being lost on the ark of salvation. That resinous pitch, prepare to be amazed. Are you ready? That resinous pitch is an interesting word. It's the Hebrew word kafar, which can also be translated as covering. Its verb is translated as to cancel, to appease, to make an atonement, to cleanse, to forgive, to be merciful, to pardon, to purge away, to reconcile. You see the connection. Just as the pitch sealed and covered all the spaces between every plank of gopher wood, the blood of Christ covers all the sins of the sinner. It forgives, it atones, it pardons, it purges, it, it makes an atonement, it appeases. The hymn writer got it exactly right. Whoops, I took that out. The hymn writer got it exactly right when he wrote, Just as I am without one plea, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because of thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And what that means then is that all of our sins can never again rise up like a flood and condemn us ever again. The Ark of Salvation is a safe place of refuge 
and security. No matter how high the waters ever rise, those inside the ark are safe, safe, safe. Let the winds blow. As hard as it can, let the wind blow. Upon the solid rock of God, I stand. Let the wind blow. Those who come to Christ find themselves not only saved, but eternally secure because Christ Jesus will preserve and protect you. Here we need John chapter 6, which says, Jesus said, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. The ark of salvation has but one door. There is only one ark, not two. And there's only one door in the ark. And there is only one plan of salvation. There is only one way of getting into the ark of salvation because there is only one gospel. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Peter said, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The ark of salvation has but one door. The ark of salvation has many different kinds of creatures in it, clean and unclean. Noah took all those animals that God sent him and clean and unclean. Our Lord Jesus came to save many kinds of sinners, clean and unclean. That is to say this. He came to save the respectable. The ones who live their lives pretty much beyond reproach. The ones who speak the truth from their hearts. The ones whose tongues rarely utter slander. The ones who do their neighbor no wrong. The ones who keep their oath even when it hurts. He came to save those ones, but even so, one thing you still lack. He also came to save the unclean, the ones who had a childhood that was nothing short of a nightmare, the ones who lived out the story of the prodigal son in their youth, the one whose mouths have been filled with all kinds of profanity and cursing and blasphemy as long as they can remember, the ones who would be considered the drunks, and the addicts, the ones who have lived their lives in bitterness and jealousy, the ones who have indulged in all kinds of sins and trespasses and impurities, the ones who have sinned against their own body and against the bodies of others, the ark was built for you too, the clean and the unclean. The most respectable person stands no higher than you and is in need of salvation no less than you. The ark of salvation is for both. And finally this. The ark of salvation will soon be leaving. Many artists have attempted to capture those final moments of agony and desperation as the waters rose and covered the earth, as the people ignored even though Noah preached for 120 years, ignored so great a salvation. There's this one, which I chose for the cover of the bulletin. There's this one that I remember as a child. I remember that one clearly as a child. It was in one of my Bible story books. And then there's this one, which I'd never seen before. And then there's two more that are too frightening to even show you. I just didn't dare to show you. Lest anyone say, oh, you're trying to scare us. You're trying to scare people. 
but there are pictures of a teenager climbing a tall tree. This tree is situated at the top of a hill, and the branch he's holding on to is breaking, and its roots are giving away because the flood is just too powerful. And a picture of a strong man climbing the highest hill to share that high hill with a tiger who's got her cub in her mouth. And this man, as he climbs, he's got his father hanging on his back. And he's got his wife holding him around the waist. And his wife is holding on to a child next to her breast. And she's got another child by the hand. And there's another child that couldn't hang on anymore and slip down. There's just no mountain that's high enough and no tree that's strong enough. Everything that they did to save themselves was false hope, false hope, and false hope. The Ark of Salvation will be leaving soon. Won't you take shelter on the Ark? Listen, the door is still open. Anyone can enter. The Bible is so right when it says today is the day of salvation. That salvation is free. Salvation is available to anyone who cares to enter in. Whosoever will may come. The invitation goes out to all the world. The prophet spoke on behalf of the Lord when we read this. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God? And not rather that he should turn from his way and live? The door is open. We are living in the season of grace. But rest assured, it will not last forever. Eventually the ark will be closed. Eventually death will come. For everyone. And that great gospel opportunity comes to an end. And judgment ends begins. These words are true. These words are faithful. These words are reality. The question is, are you in the ark of safety? There's really two questions. Have you been shut in or have you been shut or will you be shut out? So run to Christ. In your heart, in your mind, run to Christ who is your ark of salvation. Put your trust in him this very day. May you and your entire family be found safe in the ark for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful rich parable. We know it's reality. We know that the ark and Noah are true history. But Lord, we also thank you for the parable of the ark that speaks of Christ. And Lord, I would just like to myself open up my eyes and look at the congregation right now. Because Lord, perhaps there's someone here who would like to respond and say, I want to be inside that ark. I want to run to Christ today. I do not want to be left out. I want to trust Him as my Savior, and I want to make Him my Lord, who will govern my every decision, who I will walk with and talk with for the rest of my life until He takes me to be with Him forever. So I'm wondering, is there someone here who would like to lift up their hand and say, that's me. I want to be on that ark. I received Christ this morning. I haven't done it before. I want to do that right now. Put your hand up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen each one that has exercised their faith and said yes to you today. Lord, we thank you that your ark is such a safe and secure place to be in Christ. Help us to never worry about it ever again 
because you're faithful to all of your promises and you are true. Lord, we thank you for uh, the day today. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for the truth that saves us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.